Doing design chat is so rad. Yeah, doing design chat is so rad. Hello and welcome to Design Chat, the best live design discussion on the internet. I'm your host, Ryan McGovern. On Twitter, I'm at Hoopajube and at Design Chat. Every week we get together with some of the coolest people from the design community and we uh, share ideas, we commiserate, we complain about problems, and then we tell each other to shut up and get to work. And speaking of guys who get to work, we are talking to Daniel Burka and Mark Hemian. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Slap me in the face <laughs> if I am. I'm sorry. It's Hemian. No, no really. How, no do, how do you? <laughs> it's, it's a little funky. It's Hemian. 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 I don't even have a phonetic cool thing. Yeah, Hemian. I was putting the E on it like He-Man. That's kind of like the way yeah, I envision it. Yeah, that's okay. It. If you're cool with the He-Man thing, maybe we can just call you that, all right? Sure, yeah, that works. I'm a big guy. It's all good. Great score power. <laughs> unite. <laughs> um, so usually we kick off the show with brief introductions of the guest for people who might not be familiar with you or your work. Uh, Mark, why don't you uh, take the honors and go first there? Sure. Um, so like you said, my name is Mark Hemian. I'm a designer at YouTube currently. Prior to this, I uh, was co-founder of a startup called Flick that Google acquired in January of this year. Um, prior to that, done a few t-shirt sites, designbyhumans.com, tfury.com, and uh, just an all-around lovable guy full of smoke <laughs> and vigor. <laughs> <laughs> you like long walks on the beach and cats. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I hate cats, actually, but love sushi. Anyway. Okay, well, that works. Mr. Burka. So I'm Daniel Burka. Um, I uh, recently started a new company with uh, Kevin Rose called Milk Inc. And I'm sitting in our office. Um, it's a small group of people, and we're kind of planning to launch several startup ideas that we've had percolating for a while. Um, before this, I worked on a game called Glitch with a bunch of the ex Flickr founders. And then before that, I was the creative director at Dig for about five years. Um, so that was kind of a long run. And prior and during that, I was um, co founder of this company called Silver Orange, which is a, a web agency from Canada, where I hail from. And Mr. Burka was a, uh, a former guest on Design Chat during our first year of, of doing shows. So thank you again for coming back on. We talked at great length about your Silver no Orange problem. work. Yeah, uh, it's good to, good to see you again. Um, there's, there's tons of different topics I want to get to tonight, guys. Um, I do want to mention to the audience really quick, um, the fun thing about Design Chat is that you can ask questions and it's really a participatory thing. Um, go ahead and feel free to comment all you want in the chat room there, but there's a red submit a question button um, and you can either type in a text question or if you've got a webcam, you can actually get on camera and talk sort of face to face tonight. So really, I encourage you guys to do that. Uh, we'll start, start taking some of those questions in just a little bit though. So I'll, I'll wait for, for, a, queue, or for a few to queue up, if you will. Um, okay, so the, 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 the amount of amazing projects that you guys um, have been involved in is just ridiculous. There's no way we could touch on every single one of them here. We'd be here for five hours. Um, but one of the things I was thinking about is like the people who are tuning, tuning in this show, the people who are aware of you and your careers might look up to you guys in a way to think, you know, these guys have some of the most coveted jobs in design and technology and interaction. Um, but at the same time, it's not because like the job just fell in your lap, right? You guys have been doing a lot of interesting things for a long time that requires a lot of ambition. So what do you say to the people who say that our generation is like the handed to me generation, the lazy generation, the people, you know, who just expect everything is going to fall on their laps, that sort of deal. What do you, what do you say to those, uh, those comments? I think we just got called geezers. <laughs> oh man. So what do we, Not so what all. do we, so what's our, what's our retort to the, to the naysayers who, who say that we're lazy and, and uh, yeah. entitled? Is I mean, the, the generation and, and, yeah. yeah. I, Daniel, you can, if you I want to go, I have, I have a rant. That, oh, I was just going to say, I think every generation thinks that the generation that comes after them has terrible taste in music and doesn't want to do any hard work. So, I mean, it's one of those <laughs> golden history kind of things where 
It's mm -hmm. kind of the same BS comes up every 20 years. Um, but yeah, it does take a lot of hard work, and uh, you see a few young designers who really you know get into the you know the San Francisco startup scene and make make a name for themselves early, and that that's great. There's lots of talented people, but you know like a lot of other designers. When I was a kid, you know, we got out there, did a bunch of work on unsexy projects that were difficult and interesting, and you build up a portfolio over a long period of time and just do as much good work as you can, and good stuff will happen. I mean, I, we actually know I know Sky from a long time ago, just through happenstance, who used to be the creative director at IBM, and he's you know a big deal in the design world, has done incredible work that we've all seen, and. I met him when I was like 18 or 19 years old, you know, didn't just getting into web design. And one piece of advice he gave us really early on was do good work and good things will happen to you. And it sounds trite and it sounds, you know, like a cliche, but it's 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 worked out. Mm -hmm. I I would second that a, a little bit with a little bit of a different twist. I I have been a lot more ambitious about the jobs that I've had and, and the things that I've done, I've been a, more aggressive per se and not waited for people to recognize my work. I've, I've managed teams and, and one of the interesting things I found with really junior designers who are doing some really amazing work, they tend to sometimes kind of hide, hide their work and not feel a desire to self-promote. And I had a conversation with a guy one time where he's like, well, if the, if the company doesn't recognize the great work that I'm doing, then, then then they don't really understand me. They don't get me as a designer. They don't get me as what I'm doing. And and, we, and I had to have a, a chat and see, you know, no one, no one, you haven't really sold yourself as a designer. You haven't put yourself out there. There's no, not to say that you have to be self-promoting all the time, but there, that is definitely part of the hustle. Um, I, the other thing, the other great advice I got um, from a, a men, an early mentor was the, the best designers can sell their work and can, can help others uh, have buy-in and understand w why things are a certain way. And I think that's, mm -hmm. a, that's hugely important, at least to procuring. You had mentioned like, you know, if our jobs are coveted, you know, I, I, I don't covet them sometimes, you know, they're hard, but <laughs> the, um, I, think it's, I think it's the ability to sell your work. The ability, if that comes from a startup, that comes from any idea. Um, our last former function show, we had some offline chatter with some, with some budding entrepreneurs. And one of the things I noticed, there was a big disparity between those who could sell their idea when asked, why did you design this way? Why have you laid it out this way? What are you trying to communicate? And, and those who can articulate that, you can tell because their designs are, are more fulfilled and are more purposeful. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and, we, and if a designer can't do that, they just are painting things you know, beautifully, it tends to fall flat, I think. And, and they tend to fall flat and they end up becoming resentful that others aren't recognizing them for their great work. We have to kind of give other. You have to tell people why you're why you're great, in a way, in a nice way. Don't be a jerk. Uh, but there's a fine line there. I mean, right. But there's there's a lot of young designers who come across as extremely arrogant when right. there there are there's kind of a. I mean, when when Mark's talking about selling something, he means about you know explaining it and and you know showing some intellect behind what you're doing. But there's a, there's a fine line between. Having you know, being confident enough to get your work out there and to explain it to people, but without kind of stumbling into arrogance or or egotism. Co confident, not cocky. Intense, but not tense. That's my motto. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just made you an editor, by the way, Daniel. You have a, you have a great point about it being such a fine line, and it's it's a social it's a social sort of thing. Um, that a lot of young designers just don't have because they haven't been out there in the business world long enough to navigate successfully through those sort of business you know waters if you will um, but back to the generational thing a little bit not to beat it to death yeah, but it's something that I've been heavy. observing sorry uh, it's something that I've been observing a little bit is that um, there still seems to be like a generation a big generational gap between the people who grew up um, with interactivity and video games as, as they were you know coming through the rise in the internet and, and, and the business people who you know it was just before it was on the cost right before them you know and I still it still feels to me like there's still a bit of a generational gap as far as communication goes you know in that area are you speaking towards like they, they there's a generation that doesn't respect 
us because we're younger or I trying to understand a little bit more about the question are, are you suggesting that we are we have to work harder to gain respect there's a stigma to the work that we do I think Where there's a stigma and I, and I and I think there's uh, you know you have to be that much more aware of yourself and how you position yourself I mean to your point mark you I mean like you were saying you can't just you know start to put out pretty pictures and expect you know everyone in the company to fully engage in your work you have to be able to talk about it in an engaging way and back yeah. it up with real reasons yeah exactly I I do think there is uh, I have noticed though a lot of younger and I'm talking like 18 19 20 uh, there they I don't know maybe I'm, I'm gonna be an old fart right now I do I have seen <laughs> greater entitlement I have seen, hey, I got to go at one o'clock to get my hair cut. I'll see you tomorrow. I'm like, it's one o'clock. We're still working. I have seen an increase of that. I don't, but maybe that's how uh, folks felt about me when I was 19. I don't, I don't know. Um, I really love the idea of, and I'm seeing it more and more, the, the cross-section of social media and design and how powerful that can be when, when, uh, a company or a person really grasps both of those concepts well um, and I wanted to talk about Flick a little bit you know you guys were acquired by Google in January of this last year um, and for people who aren't familiar with Flick the, the brief sort of summary of that is it analyzes social media data to surface great content and the discussions around it so I just want to hear a little bit about your experience of discovering the power of social media with the cross-section of design one of the one of the crazy things about Twitter is there's all this noise going on and uh, Kurt Wilms who kind of came up with the idea of Flick came to me one day and he was curating all this signal on on Twitter around movies for any given movie he could really he was able to organize it in such a way that I could I could see what my friends were saying about movies and that was really interesting to me mm -hmm. out of the millions and millions of tweets he was able to find this little signal and with a little bit of UI polish we were able to turn that into a product and that's what, yeah. and that was very compelling for Google. And I think we're going to see more of that as we're sharing, we're all sharing more of our lives um, on Facebook, on Twitter, or on, you know, on Google, on YouTube, wherever. Um, it's going to come to a point where how the hell do you organize all this stuff so it makes sense and it's easy to kind of get through this and, and we can find the things that, that are important to us. Twitter right now, I only check it a few times a day because it's still, it's terribly overwhelming. Um, and so the one thing that we did that we looked at with Flick was, you know, let's pull out just the, the little signals about a specific niche. And uh, that seemed to be compelling. People really seemed to, to that, like that. So you guys have been there for six months now. And I, I want to say it's mm -hmm. been, it's sort of hard at this point. Google is like stretching into so many different interesting areas. They've got so many cool teams and so many cool projects. It's hard to completely understand what Google is and how, and how it works. I don't think you can. Um, I just want to hear a little bit about your experience, you know, in those doors for this last six months. Yeah, th um, I mean, there's, that, there's obviously a lot of things that we work on that we can't talk about publicly, but I will say um, we've been able to stay together as a team and just really work very dynamically and very um, iteratively on, on our projects. It's been pretty hands off and we've been having a great time. So there's, there's kind of a certain, it was funny the first week, we're like, all right, what should we work on? And, the, and it was right back, what do you want to work on? And so it's a little kid in the candy store. You know, there's wonderful resources at Google and, and you can, the sky's kind of the limit. I mean, technically, mm -hmm. right? If you come up with an idea, there's somebody here who can, who can help you figure that out. So we, we, as a startup, you know, we've had, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for the other guys, but I, we, I think we've all had a really, really great welcoming experience, you know, better than we help, better than we thought, you know, it's a big company. There's, you know, you could have, it could have been fearful of getting swallowed up, but they've uh, allowed us to stay together and work together. So it's been good. I forgot to mention at the beginning of this that one of the reasons why I've got both of you guys here tonight, um, not only because Daniel's been on the show before, but you guys started to do some live broadcasts that you're now calling former function. You didn't quite have a name for it at the beginning. Um, and they're fun little broadcasts. Like sometimes you decide it's sort of in the moment, like you can tell it's of the moment, you know? And like I, have, I participated in one where you guys were taking portfolio critiques. And that was, that was amazing to see people jump in and be willing to share their ideas and their work and receive feedback. So tell me a little bit about that joint venture, Daniel. 
Oh, so it was kind of, uh, Mark was just hanging out at my apartment in San Francisco one day, and uh, we were kind of just discussing the possibility of doing a, a podcast, and we're like, screw this, we could just do it right now. And so we just both <laughs> tweeted out about it, grabbed a, you know, a webcam, sat down on a couch together, and the first episode, I think we called it uh, Two Dudes on a Couch, Two Designers on a Couch, something like that. And, uh, I mean, right now it's a really informal two thing, dudes, which one is couch. great. You know, we don't have a schedule. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. The joke was made. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very informal. I, we just, I don't even know what you're talking. We, we don't know what you're talking about. We're ready. Sorry, I think there's we a big. We do it like the creative so process. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm uh, coming off at the wrong time. No worries, no worries. We you're, do not, you're not sitting in the right cancer like stream of the Wi-Fi. <laughs> no, it's good to hear people are enjoying those. I, I we, we're gonna try to do more of them. We kind of do it when our schedules kind of magically align, but it's yeah. it's been amazing seeing all the good work that people are doing. I, I get so inspired seeing people's ideas and mocks, and I just I love it. So it's super fun. I hope we can do more of it. Definitely, cool. Um, well, definitely keep us posted. I just saw that um, you guys have a new Twitter account for that. It's at um, for more function on Twitter so everybody make sure to follow that I'm sure you guys will post through there uh, about upcoming shows and that sort of deal yeah um, the next the next thing I want to talk about in 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 the sort of realm of milk and, and some of the cool stuff you guys are uh, slowly releasing and slowly announcing what those things are going to be um, there's a new uh, experience you guys have coming out called oink um, and there, I'm seeing, you know, there's tons of games, there's tons of inter interactions right now that are solely based on, not solely based, but a big component on, on location. And it seems like, you know, in the last couple of years of design conferences and interaction con conferences, it was, everything's about location and being able to have a mobile phone that has a browser and be able to tell where you're at, right? And there were, there were some really good things that came out and a lot of crap things that came out. Is, is location going to be a fad? Is it something that's going to die out because so many people do it wrong? Or is it something that's going to be sustainable for years to come? Well, I don't think that location itself is really a feature. It's, location is a useful tool that can make other applications richer. And so I think right at the beginning, everyone got very excited. You know, all of a sudden we can vaguely know where somebody is. And... So the first, you know, kind of wave of things were things like Google Latitude or Foursquare or Guala. They were very focused on like specifically about, you know, the the point that you're at. The, the interesting element of locations, which is, you know, what is the thing that's at that location, which is I can finish this. Daniel's this cutting morning. out a little bit. <laughs> uh, um, I, he's back. You're back. Um, I, I know that a lot of stuff at, at Milk is kind of hush hush right now. You can't say a whole lot. But what what sort of progress can you share with us at this point about what's going on in in that building? <laughs> oh, things are going really well. We're working on um, Oink, which is the the biggest project that we're working on, um, and that's coming fairly close to to a launch so hopefully we'll have that out there sooner than later i'll, I'll still be fairly vague about that but um it, we're we're getting close on that one and then we're, we're also working on a small project that should be out shortly thereafter and then we've got we were just talking the other day about kind of what our next large project might be and we have a few really really good ideas in the hopper so yeah, there's a lot of production going on here. It's a it's a really small team, so we build as quickly as we can. But uh, I'm pretty excited about our the the potential project. It's this great sort of common theme of you know what we're seeing right now from creative people, creative endeavors who are becoming entrepreneurs who are deciding not to work for clients anymore and going out and, and creating things that interest them um, because you get a better product, a better result. Um, both of you guys have been involved in that a little bit. So talk a little bit about the idea of, of a jump from working for clients to working for yourself. You want to go, Daniel? Oh, sure. Um, it's, the, it, this, it's, a, it's a really interesting subject. I think I really like that a lot of designers <clears throat> are now starting to call themselves product designers. 
because I think designers are in a very unique position to be making product decisions because they're uh, generally empathetic towards users. They are able to think about a whole, uh, you know, a system as a whole. And so I think that's, you know, I, I really like that 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 trend. And then, you know, if you're good at building products, that means you're also generally, you know, interested in coming up with products and and you know developing them on your own. I, I really like you know kind of 37 signals a few you know years ago finally figured out that why the heck are we helping other people make a ton of money building applications we've got some good ideas why don't we make our own applications and that's mm -hmm. you know it, it's pretty much exactly how i feel about it um all right here's here's a good one what's better being overwhelmingly happy with a project, knowing that it's a complete success, everybody loves it, they're interacting with it, it's taking off, it's a lot of fun, or sex? <laughs> uh, I've been married 12 years, so I think a project <laughs> that everyone's interacting with. Oh, I mean, wait, sex. I can't. Answer. Yeah, I'm gonna go. <laughs> I will. I will tell the sex sex answer there. There's a. I will say there's a pretty incredible I dopamine like rush. Design, but... I like product design, but. But wait, 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 wait. When when you launch Oink, you are gonna postpone sex while you sit around <laughs> your computer, seeing all the feedback come in. When are we gonna get on TechCrunch? We're gonna watch your journal. And, You're and, saying you I know, can't do both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I think I Daniel's it's taking hard. this as a challenge. It's hard. <laughs> I do, I agree. Picks or it didn't happen. <laughs> That's awesome. No, but it's pretty, I, I'll tell you, it's pretty addictive. It's pretty addictive to launch something and to get people's reactions, good and bad. When we launched Flick, for example, we made an interesting decision where when you, you had to sign in with your Twitter account, we had a little checkbox. Well, we made the decision to keep that checkbox checked, and what it would do is it was it would automatically tweet out when you signed in with your Twitter account. So we basically spammed Twitter to death for about an hour and a half. Next thing I know, these like industry, like these design, in my mind, these design like powerhouses, you know, you know Eric Meyer, Coy, uh, Jeffrey Zeldman, like all these guys just start, they, you know, I'm not on their radar at all. Next thing I know, I'm just getting ripped to shreds on the Twitterverse. Like, Flick looks cool, but man, I I didn't expect to tweet this out, and they just start ripping me a new one, and so of course within about an hour we took it off. But um, anyway, I was like, oh hey, nice to meet you. Sorry, so that I just was better than sex. You spam. Better than sex? No, that wasn't better than sex. But I'm just saying that <laughs> being ripped by Jeffrey Zeldman was better than sex. I think you're avoiding the question mark. Well, Mark, I, I think, think you tapped into better, like I know it was a joke. It was a joke of a question, but. But there is this natural high that if you're really engaged in what you do, you really believe in what you do, you're passionate about it, and then something that you've worked on for months uh, launches and comes to fruition and it's well received, there is that dopamine high. There is that natural high that you get of, yeah. man, I can't wait to do this again. I can't wait to make something awesome. Oh, yeah, it's really addicting. And and. But we, you have that on micro levels, and one of the reasons Twitter and Facebook are successful is because you're getting a constant nourishment of your ego. You know, people are liking what you say, or commenting on what you say, they're following you. Design is the same way, and it's why when we do the critiques, it's kind of challenging, because I don't know where people's heads are when they show us a design and it sucks, and we have to kind of construct feedback around that. Um, you know, you want to be sensitive to it because you are expressing yourself, you're expressing a bit of your soul. So, you know, I. When you release a product, you know when Oink releases, some people are going to love it, some people are going to hate it, um, mm -hmm. and that's that's going to be I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how it's how it's received, and it'll be interesting to see how Daniel takes it all. He'll probably take it great, or he'll probably tell him to all pound sand. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, da I'm Daniel's one of the best people at giving feedback. By the way, critical feedback. He, he's very good. He's very good at that. Mark, why do you say that? Because he pulls no punches, I can. It doesn't matter how close we are, or or you know what we talked about. I can show him a design, and if it is not good, he will tell me it is not good, and he'll do it in such a way that it's not offensive. Um, he'll articulate the reason why, and it'll frankly inspire me to to push and do better. It's very hard to do. Some people don't can't quite 
pull it off the same way. Um, but I, Daniel is one of the only people I trust to show him something. And I know for, if it's not good, he will tell me it is not good. He will not bullshit me. He will not be like, oh, it's kind of, yeah, that's cool. Good luck. He'll take the time and the energy and the effort to be like, mm, it's too tight. The layout doesn't work. Where's the call to action? And there's the hierarchy's all screwed up. What's going on? So props to you, Daniel. I think there was a, I think there was a uh, thank you. I think there's a, yeah. a really good article Koi Vin wrote, it must be about two years ago, maybe three years ago, where he argued that designers are basically were too nice to each other and were a bunch of sycophants. And you see that on Dribble a lot. You know, people post things and everybody just wants to say something nice. Hey, great work. You know, that looks <laughs> awesome. And that's that's easy feedback to give, yeah. you know, even if you're honest about it. But it's really hard to critique each other. You know, I, I've you know, done talks at conferences before and you come out afterwards and you know it wasn't the best talk you've ever done and you're just like, ah, oh, guys, like, you know, what can I do better? And they're like, I don't know, it was great. And you know it wasn't great. You want somebody to step up and be able to tell you, hey, next time you give that talk, here's three things you can do better. I mean, some I, people want that. It, some some people don't want that. I want that. Some people just want you to... I want that, kind of. I half want it. Sometimes I don't want it. Yeah. Maybe you'll never it's, get any better. It's hard because it seems so many of these reaction. tools exist for the ego boost. Yeah, and that's that generational thing. For sure. Did, did, well, they go both yeah. ways. They're either for the ego boost or for the haters. <laughs> yeah. So but that's people part. can anonymous, anonymously come on and just rip something to shreds without any re repercussion of, you know, saying something face-to-face uh, -face where you could get hit or punched or yelled at or Man. you know get angry in your direction or something this, like that it's just is, so easy to anonymously sign on to things well this is the night of koi vin i feel like he had another great blog post someone redesigned uh new york times and it got a lot of chatter you know and, and they this person just it looked beautiful the work the redesign looked great but koi basically said all right all you guys out there redesigning american airlines or new york times or whatever it might be like it's it's good for you to do this from your kind of glass house, but you don't have the context, you don't know the constraints, you don't know the challenges that that we had to deal with, and it was a really good article as well. It was it was well stated, and, and you know we see that at YouTube. There's um, there's folks all the time trying to redesign stuff. In fact, there was a a young man from Scotland. We ended up hiring him as an intern because because he redesigned YouTube and he and he wrote this big long article about why and and did a very, very, very great job and really put a lot of thought and energy into it. And we saw that and we thought, hey, this is, this is someone we'd like to kind of bring in here. And uh, I've been his mentor actually this yeah. summer um, and he's done great and it's been wonderful having him. So sometimes it works, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting There's lesson, a link to actually, Koi Vin in the chat room. I remember when we first did the, the, when we first did the Mozilla redesign, you know, this is a long time ago in 2004 when I was working on that project. And I, I la we, we launched the design, and some guy, um, his, his handle was Antcon. I can, I can still remember this. This is like, you know, seven years ago. And he posted a picture of the Mozilla web, web page that we had just designed. And it was, a, I, I thought, I still think, it was a massive improvement from what came before. But he posted massive red X's across most of the thing. A lot of insulting language about, you know, why the did you do that? This stuff's useless. Get rid of it. And I, I was, you know, I'd never worked on anything that was as, as high profile as Mozilla before. And I'd never seen feedback like this. And I immediately kind of shut down. And I noticed myself still doing this when someone, you know, I, I'm really proud of something and somebody gives me, gives me a negative reaction to it, especially if they don't set it up by saying something positive first. But if, you, if I look back at what he said, it, it almost is entirely right. He didn't understand what the political battles were, you know, about, you know, somebody was owed this and, you know, that's why we couldn't do certain things on the Mozilla site. But if you look at what Mozilla looks like now, it looks ex very similar, actually, to what he had suggested. So you have to be really careful about, you know, saying, well, we can't do that because we've got these political battles. And sometimes it's a, it's a good thing, you know, to look and say, well, maybe that constraint's not such a big constraint. Maybe we can... You know this thing that we're taking for granted or this battle i didn't want to fight maybe it's worth fighting try to we get got some questions to... coming in from the audience okay. here we're going to start taking those go ahead mark finish your thought 
Oh, I was going to say, I think it's good as a designer to try to get fired every day. Do stuff that's just off the wall. Because no one else is going to. You're not, you're not going to get some PM or some engineer coming at you with crazy ideas. I mean, sometimes they do. But, I mean, we write the future. We write the vision. So there's no harm. No one is going to get killed from a mock, right? Someone might get a little heartburn. But, that, but I do think, as designers, yeah. you should push, 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 and, and, uh, and write the future. That sounds so weird and lame, and I apologize, but someone's going to retweet. <laughs> Write the future. It's going to be the heavy quote for the night. It's going to be... So silly. It sounds like... Yeah, the, uh, it's going to live in infamy. We're going to take our first question tonight. Uh, cool. R. Burton wants to know, will you guys ever do a live review of websites? Uh, we do do sure. That. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think we have to be careful which one. They will, like a... and you need to follow former function on Twitter to find out. Oh, nice. Good, smart plug. I don't know that we'll tackle like Craigslist and PayPal oh. and eBay, but I, I think we prefer to tackle folks who come to the chat. And, I don't know, keep it kind of homegrown like that. Yeah. And the, the guy who asked the yeah, question, and that's the, the exciting girl, I can't tell, asked if we do, we do their own user submitted stuff. And absolutely, yeah, that's the. Yeah part of the, the whole point of former function. So come submit your work. We will give it a, a rough go. <laughs> Be like, <laughs> we'll rip you to shreds. No, that's no, the exciting love. thing about you know, some of these interactions is the people who um, turn the tables a little bit from I'm just going to broadcast all of my thoughts and you know, say things about me and pitch my work and tell people how great I am to um, I want to connect with people outside. I want to share uh, my ideas. I want to hear ideas from other people. And when that, when that, you can tell the vibe completely changes when organiz, you know, like podcasts or whatever, whoever is broadcasting decides to also let in and absorb and have that sort of back and forth. And it's, I think it's really a monumental time where we're, we're getting some of those interactions now, and it's, it's just very exciting. People are awesome. Right. How can Any you not say that working at YouTube? Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of people, we've got what types of activities do you find uh, have been the best ways to self-promote from Tim Georgie? Um, I, I'll, I'll take the first stab. One of the things we saw with Design by Humans and T-Fury, it's a t-shirt contest site very similar to Threadless. And one of the most annoying things were when people would say, hey, go vote for my t-shirt design, or it was this kind of forced social connection, and we see this on Twitter all the time. Hey, will you retweet my stuff, whatever? And that just doesn't work. So you have to obviously be authentic. And it's, it, like in the t-shirt community, there are all these sidebar forums. There's MTs and t-shirtforums.com, and it's through, the, it's through just participating in those and building up relationships with, with that organization that you actually start getting this kind of network effect of self-promotion. Because there's hundreds of, you know, there's thousands of people in all these different networks. Same thing with Twitter. I mean, most of the people that I follow and interact with are other designers. And and it turns out when you're friends with a bunch of folks and you share something on Twitter, if they're your friends, they're going to share it too. And that just will naturally propagate. Um, that and I think, you know, naked pictures always help. Just kidding. Go ahead, Daniel. Sorry. Oh, I'm not sure I've got much to say. I, I'm not much at at, uh, at self-promoting myself, but uh, I mean, lucky enough to hang out with Kevin Rose, and you get a lot of spillover from uh, his, uh, I mean, he's a very good self-promoter, so ha hang out with Kevin more? <laughs> Wait, right, yeah, perfect tip. Um, we've got another good question here from... Um... R. Burton, I'm not sure in exactly what context this follows under, but should the primary action button be displayed first or second, search versus cancel? Um, having not been involved in you know, interactive design too much, I'm not sure if this is a common debate or a common question. Is this something that comes up a lot? I've never I, heard this before. I, I would I say did... make it the most primary placement. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends what the context. Primary is. button should be primary. Uh, like you start at the beginning. 
I'll, I'll tell you, I just actually, we, I had this discussion recently. At the bottom of a form, it was cancel or submit. I put cancel as a link on the left and submit on the right, which was the second in that alignment, but whatever. Hey, but the, but the, uh, the, the, I don't know, I didn't even make them the same thing. I think the question is, the primary action would be displayed first or second. Make the primary action a button. The secondary thing, why does it need to be a button? Make it something else. So anyway. Yeah, or does it even need to be there at all? Yeah. I mean, there's cancel on way too many web forms that you would never want to cancel or you could just click away from. Yeah. Like some modal or something, just click off of it. That's a very specific question. Our Burton, you should show up to design chat and show us what you Speaking did and we'll check it out. Or the former function. Same difference. Either way, submit it now. Submit it as a question. We'll take it. <laughs> um, speaking of direct, uh, what is this from Dylan Al Abishire? This is design chat. Um, this is <laughs> live a live experience where we what bring on designers <laughs> and we, we talk about their work. Yeah, what um, the hell is going on? I'd like to know also. Existential um, question. And we, like, we really? do it mostly it? Every, every week. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's podcasts. We screen capture the whole thing. You can search for it on iTunes, search Design Chat, and uh, they automatically download as soon as you subscribe to it. It's lots of fun, and uh, it's a good time. So you should uh, keep coming in. Um, I'm going to encourage the audience to keep on asking questions here. I want to remind you that you can ask a video question. If you've got a webcam, um, you type in a little description of what you're going to ask, and then we approve it, and then, boom, you show up, and you're sort of face-to-face. You guys both worked, if, if I was reading some of these bios correctly, you were working at DIG at the same time. Um, what we, we, we barely what time was other. that? How long ago? What, you barely yeah, missed we each other? Ships in the night. Yeah. yeah, so I want to hear a little bit about that story and like, yeah, and, and your, your, your involvement at DIG. <laughs> DIG. DIG's been in the press lately. Kevin was uh, talked a little bit about DIG the other day with Michael Arrington. Um, I, I don't know, I can talk... Daniel interviewed me on his way out. Um, he took me for lunch, and uh, he had some some critiques of my CSS skills and a few other things. And uh, and I don't know. And then that's it. We hung out a little bit for a few weeks while he we buttoned up a few things, and uh, met his dog. Um, but during that time, that time at Dig was a kind of a gnarly time. We were trying to. We were trying to rethink what the next version of Dig. This is before Dig V4 came out, um, and we were, you know, a lot of brainstorming, a lot of thinking going on. Daniel handed me a drive with like three gigs worth of, of his thinking, um, with just countless numbers of mocks, um, and I found I found that time period very challenging professionally. Um, it was also during that at night I was working. We were working on Flick, so I'd go grind all day at at, uh, at, at Dig, trying to organize a, some a fairly chaotic time at Dig, and then go work till three in the morning, um, away from my wife and my three three beautiful kids. So, from a, on a personal level, it was a very difficult time for me. I don't know if that was your question, but <laughs> I don't know if I answered it. No, totally. Totally, and, and and Daniel, Mark mentioned that you know you interviewed him um, as he was coming in. Uh, is that a, a function that you performed a lot in in acquiring talent to come into the group? No, oh, absolutely. I was in did a lot of interviews. So, well, obviously with the design positions because I ran that team. So I'd interview any potential designer who's going to join the team. But I also mm -hmm. interviewed um, product managers. And uh, some developers, particularly if they're working in the front end, where you know I had a lot more experience. But yeah, definitely product people, marketing people, and biz dev people. I, I generally was in the room to interview them, which is you know it's it's really interesting because you have to you know I learned a lot about bringing in people who not only have the the technical talent but also have um, kind of fit in the culture of a company. It's really hard to maintain a, a good culture in a company, I think, and that's something you know we're striving to do at, at Milk here. And there is a position open at Milk. If you go to milkinc.com, uh, I believe it was a UI designer, or was it? A, no, it was a back a developer position. I saw that yeah, we're earlier looking for today. A, an engineer. Um, so if you want to be interviewed by Daniel, go scaling. click on that. 
Wait, Daniel, was I a good interview or was I a crappy interview? Give me some interview feedback. <laughs> oh, you were a good interview. I was timid. You were, you were confident. You had the experience to back it up. Yeah, your tim timidity yeah, is, uh, is, is nothing. You were like, you need to have opinions. You told me, you said, you need to have opinions at Dagger. You're going to get eaten alive. I think you, or you said something like that. And I was like, oh, crap. I don't want to fight with people. <laughs> Do you remember saying something like that? I don't remember it the same way so you how... remember it. Oh, sorry. That's fine. Who? So, Daniel, how early into that conversation in these – I mean, because it's, it's got to be so hard to, like, get over that first impression of showing you all the best things about me to – you know, to really sort of know that person is a sort of deal where like within 15 minutes of talking to someone, you can sort of hone in on, on, on who they are and if they're going to work or not. Or does it take like three interviews, with lots of emails, filling out personality uh, tests and that, that sort of BS? Or is it something that you can just connect with? Oh, it's definitely not a momentary thing. You can get a really good impression of somebody quickly and then figure out later on that they're not really going to be a good fit. So I wouldn't say it's instantaneous, but it's also, you know, it's definitely not something as robotic as a personality test. I try to, you know, I obviously, mm -hmm. technically I can tell a lot about a person from their code and from their, um, their, their portfolio. The portfolio is the primary means of telling, you know, whether or not someone's got talent. And then I generally get them to do like a demo project. So something that's not necessarily directly related to what I'm working on, but something That, that is something amazing saying at the beginning and um, but after that you know I try to go out and have lunch with them a couple of times go out and get beers with them stuff like that you get a much better sense for you know what somebody's like when you're you're not specifically talking about work we've got a couple more questions popping in here we're gonna take one from um... Samuel and Anderson who wants to know is it okay to be a designer and not know anything about coding? No. No. <laughs> is it okay? I mean nice. Because I don't know anything about I mean no nothing, like nothing at all, nothing, like zero nothing? How much is nothing? Well, let's rephrase it. Can can, can a designer um, function? Say they've gone, to, you know, to design school and they get visual communication. Um, can they pop into, say, an interactive shop and be able to perform their their job successfully if they have absolutely no idea of what happens on the back end? Oh, that's a different question, though. I don't think you need to understand the back end. It really I think you need to understand the presentation later. What level that they, they want to work at. I think absolutely you can make a salary, you can get a job, and you can do some half decent web work without knowing a ton about how the back end stuff works. If you want to be good at it though, if you want to mm -hmm. like you know, really pursue it as a career and be proud of your work, you better learn some code. You don't have to be able to, you know, write C and, you know, like even high level PHP, but have it some sense about how, you know, the, the fundamental development works and I would encourage you to learn HTML and CSS and a little bit of JavaScript at least. I think you'll be a much, much better mm -hmm. designer for it. it. It's it doesn't take that I don't know, it's not that hard. That's the point problem. If HTML and CSS were super, super hard, then I'd have a little more mercy. But I they're just they're just not that hard. If you spend some Spend some time, get a few books. There are so many resources out there that teach CSS and markup. Um, I don't know. You may you may find a hidden skill or hidden talent you didn't know. Now there are designers who just do topography and layout. Mm -hmm. They're not internet product type designer folks. And this may you know the work that Daniel and I do is very very different from the work that um, someone who's laying out a movie poster that you would see at the theaters. That's very very different work, right? And and I think that. When early print uh, advertising agencies tried to move into the web space in the early 2000s and stuff, a lot of them fumbled because they thought they could make that direct transition from just traditional graphic designer to web designer. And there are different disciplines entirely. And so I think if you're a web designer, you better learn how to code. And you better learn how to do it well because, no one, because what's going to happen is you're going to turn your work over to an engineer who's going to just destroy it. 
and you need to be able to show them how you would how you would cut things up, how you would code it, and present those kind of code samples. Be like, look, this is a way to do it. And we do that. We do this here. We have a go ahead, Daniel. Sorry. I was going to say, if you if you want to call yourself an interaction designer, which you know I would you know that's a, certainly a big piece of my job description. You have to be able to code in order to show the interactions. Photoshop is just a way of showing a static mockup, and you have to show how you know one thing flows into the other thing. You have to show how what what happens on hover. Uh, you know what are the different states of something look like? How do they transition from one to the next? Those kinds of things are really only explicable in code. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, and the other thing is, how are you going to answer a front-end engineer when you do this beautiful design and they say, oh, I can't, we can't do that. That's impossible. If you can code, you can be like, BS, yeah. and do it and show them. <laughs> with a smile, yeah. with Absolutely. love, buy them, no, a, I agree more. Buy, them some, buy them something shiny that they love, you know, whatever. Buy some bucky balls. Well, this is or... a good follow-up question here. What what about the other way around? What is the best way for a developer to get good at visual design from Greg Squeeb? <laughs> this is a great question. That's a, I'm glad you're asking that question. Um, the the biggest thing is to try it. Jump in there. Design something simple. Does you know? Don't don't have to build the most sophisticated application on earth but if you're a developer and you've been around and seen a lot of you know different examples collect some things that you've seen done well try to replicate them and innovate on top of them and i mean that's generally how most designers have learned their trade is just trial and error build more mm -hmm. stuff and you've got the tools to at least you know really get going on your own you should be fairly self-sufficient at it and then you know hopefully team up with some you know designers who you respect who you can get feedback from i i was going to say also there's there's a lot of great tools twitter just released uh twitter bootstrap um jquery has jquery ui there are some wonderful libraries that not that they're going to do the whole design for you but they give you kind of a leg up so that your apps don't look like complete crazy mm -hmm. donkey tails um so ultimately um design can be learned i think topography can be learned Hierarchy can be learned. You can learn how to organize uh, organize things. Um, um, to Daniel's point, I, you know, copy. Look at someone else, uh, someone's site out there, and just copy it, and and figure it out. You know, you can't find a design that you think is beautiful. Like go to the Apple website and copy it. Many people do. They do a a big tout in the middle with three mini touts down below, some nav across the top, and a logo. Done. You know, and obviously spin it a little bit don't totally rip it but if you're a developer and that you know th th this is where you can start um and this is where many designers start they see a design mm -hmm. they love hell just go look at dribble you see someone post something rad next thing you know you have 400 cousins and in incantations of someone's dribble and uh you know you can see you can see how this works artists do this all the time they take a photo and they'll you know if they want to learn to draw a tree they'll take a picture of a tree and they will draw the exact tree this is how they learn but don't copy. That's it's bad. To your That's point, the, Mark, this is a Ty Matson was just on the show not too long ago. Great designer, Matson Creative, um, and he was saying the same thing. Um, it's not a bad thing if you're if you feel like you're still in the learning stages and you need to expand your your sort of vision. Go out, grab something you think is beautiful, and try to recreate it. Not in the sense of I'm going to uh, steal and I'm going to publish it and make money on it. Um, it's just the necessary steps to put your br your brain through to understand how how objects are built, right? How, how to lay things out, how to understand layout. Um, and then you try to apply those lessons to if you're actually pursuing it as a career in your next project. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Josh, Josh Colley is, uh, he, he's our intern at YouTube. He's there in the chat. Set him right, Josh. Josh is actually a software engineer who at a university he's learning, you know, he codes in gnarly, you know, C and all that fun stuff. But he's here at YouTube working as a, as a designer. I'll tell you what, Josh was able to prototype ideas awesome. very rapidly and very quickly. We had we had designs that had they not had a prototype, we could not have convinced and had buy in to get them through. You know, when we're playing with things like on the video player things like what happens when the video stops and, and the interaction on the end screen. Those things uh, deeply depend on creating a prototype before anyone codes anything. 
so you can convince people that this is the right thing mm -hmm. to do. If you're a designer and you can't code, and you, even just doing things in Flash, for heaven's sakes, then you're, you, you know, back to what I said very early on, great designers can sell their work. Selling their work isn't always just describing it with words. It's using pictures, interaction, any means possible to convince others that this is kind of the right idea, the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. We've got a question for Daniel here. Uh, can you explain the process of, of creating an iOS app versus a web app? Ready, go. <laughs> oh, sure. It's a great question. Um, it, it's an interesting problem because it's a, a much more focused problem and a much more um, limited problem in some ways that, you know, you only have the option of having five major menu items if you're going to stay with, like, uh, a default iOS tab bar. Um, but I, I'll be careful answering this because it's not like I'm terribly experienced with building iOS apps. This is only, you know, my second app, really, that I've worked on. But... It, it's been interesting that you know, in some ways, I don't code it myself because I don't know enough C uh, to work as as fast as the other developers. But um, I've been mocking up some things in HTML and CSS and showing them how I would you know, and getting them to replicate uh, you know the the kind of behaviors I'm expecting. So that that's really interesting, and um, it's it's also interesting that uh, you're just designing on a device that's a lot more predictable on a, on a web browser. You're designing for different sizes. You're designing for you know people on tablets versus people on computers versus people on you know using all kinds of different monitors. So you can't really trust color that kind of thing. So I spend a lot more time when I'm designing with iOS, actually walking around with a device in my hand and using things like Live View or the um, this app called Prototype that you can put um, kind of a flowchart your app in. And it's very useful to actually stand up, get out off your desk, and walk around a bit and see if your text is actually legible enough when you know you're on the move and, and you know just glancing at a screen. Are the buttons big enough to actually tap? Those kinds of things that are, are very different from the the you know the more familiar problems to me of, of building web apps. Great question, Patrick Navarro. That was awesome. Thank you for submitting that. Um, we're going to drop that. Um, we've got, just so you guys know in the chat room, we've got another uh, like eight or ten minutes left in the chat. So if you want to get your questions in, ask them now. We might not get to all of them, but please try to submit them and get them in. Um, here is the recommendation section of the night from Bill English. Any mobile apps you've been inspired by recently? Oh man, no, I'm, I'm pulling, I'm pulling really out like my Listery phone. L-I-S-T-A-R-Y. <laughs> it's these European guys who are, are making Listery, and it's this really, so I've, I've used a bunch of to-do apps. You know, it's basically just a bunch of to-do lists, but most of them are way overthought, and they people are uh, unwilling to make something that's just simple. And these guys stayed focused, chose, you know, a few basic features, and we're ballsy enough to stick with those basic features. I think it's a really well designed app and they're doing some some really nice iterative improvements. Mark, what do you got what do you got there on your phone? <laughs> I have silly things. I don't have anything terribly. This is the one I've been playing with the most. Songify? Have you guys played this? Hold on, it's I'm amazing. Make... Oh, yeah. Songify? This is Oh yeah, there's a crack on my screen. Songify. I can tap to record a song. Here, let's do this. Um, oh yeah, doing design chat, it's so rad. Stop. And then let's see if I can, let's see what I can do here. Let's see, I'll try to play it in the speaker. That's here. gonna be our new intro music, dude. Oh yeah, doing design chat, it's so rad. Yeah, doing design chat, it's so rad. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Cool. So anyway, you can pick what song you would like to have songified, and it just loops through, and that's it, man. It's great. You can do any song you want, like Double Rainbow. This is from the folks, uh, the Gregory Brothers, who do, who do yeah. uh, you know, hide your kids, hide your wife, and hide your husbands, too. So they're awesome. That they, anyway, made that? That they made that? The, um, they made oh, that, oh, yeah. Uh, it's something the news. What is it? Um, Auto-tune the news. Auto tune the news. Those guys are awesome. Yeah, yeah. So that's a good one. And uh, 
I'm always I'm always pitching uh, the better tweet Twitter client Tweetbot. Tweetbot from uh, Paul Haddad and uh, Mark Jardine. It's a great app. Tweetbot. Anyway. Can you do search Tweetbot. filters in that? Like have columns of searches. I mean, yeah, search looks like that. I don't know if you can see. It's just bitching looking. They did a really nice job. It's really clean. Has cool little sounds. Cool. By the um, way, if you're looking yeah. in the chat room right now, we're, we're linking up to the things that we're talking about. We have a specific Twitter account. If you want to um, go back and follow at Design Chat Links, it, you, it categorizes the links that we talk about during the live show. Well, let's do a couple more questions. We're almost at the 9 o'clock hour here. So um, let's see. We've got Sh Sean from Vocal. He's a great dude. He, he helps us out. He actually works at Vocal. He wants to know your oh, thoughts hell. on it. Um, he helps us out all the time. He, he's a really great guy, and the team at Vocal has been amazing with support for us. So, I found it easier to use in uh, Ustream right. and Justin TV, and that's why we used it last time we did our former function. <laughs> yeah, I find ahead, it Daniel. easier to use for sure, but I also find it really unnecessarily complicated in a lot of ways. Here comes one of those true of uh, critiques from Daniel Burka. <laughs> Hey, if he didn't want feedback, he shouldn't have asked. <laughs> we when we had a hell of a time finding how to let, like we didn't know how to use the audience question thing as a when you're when you're doing a video. All the tools are really hard to use. The, the basic obvious. trying to scroll through a chat using the flash scroll bars is it's brutal. Like if there's you know twenty people trying to chat at you and you're trying to get to the bottom of the chat thing. It's really, really difficult to do that. Um, um, and just generally, there's, there's kind of a, an, an extraordinary amount of things trying to go on at the same time. I think it could probably be you know, focused and a little bit more simplified. It's a pretty good app. I mean, we, we enjoy using it. So you know, take my, my criticism with a grain of salt. That's awesome. Well, with that, I think that brings us to the end of our, uh, our design chat show. I want to thank you guys again for coming on um, and spending time with us. Make sure everybody in the chat room follow Former Function on Twitter to find out about more chats that are happening between Mark and Daniel and get your work critiqued. Um, I want to thank uh, Symbolic, which is where we're broadcasting from, a great design group here in West uh, Dundee, Illinois. Check them out on the web, smbolic.com. They're awesome. They've got the CUSP conference that's coming up uh, in a couple weeks here. We just gave tickets away to that last year, um, or last week rather, so uh, look forward to that, guys. And um, again, thank you for coming on and spending some time with us. It was a lot of fun. You bet. Thank you so much. It's really great. Yeah, thank you. Everybody in the, in the chat room, post your uh, Twitter link so everybody can follow everybody. Um, uh, thanks and good night. We'll talk to you guys soon. See you guys.